Hello. Hello. Everything's okay? Yes, yeah. Uh, Hello. You can see the screen. Yes, there is no problem. Yes, we see it. Okay. And recording is already on or sh I should do recording when I start? Now it's recording, but in fact, normally we record since you start, when you start the, the lecture. So you can get it and record when you start. Okay. I turn it off now. So yeah. Should I do that right? Mark, can you do that? Because somehow I can't find that in my screen. Okay. You can see the participants, but I can't see the... No, it's video. recording. So you can start your lecture. I think it's two o'clock. You, you can start. I, I'm, okay. And we let the recording as it is now. Yeah. Okay, right. Okay, I shall start. Hello, everyone. Today I will present you the rock surface dating technique using optically stimulated luminescence technique. But first, I will make a quick review of the meaning of the OSL dating. Luminescence dating is based on so storing energy in some minerals like a quartz and Phyllis spars. Uh, because of radiation or exposing to uh, radiation from the surrounding in environment. After a long time of exposing to radiation, the mineral capacity of storing this energy which will, will reach its saturation level. The zeroing event happens when the material or minerals are exposed to heat or light, which allow this stored energy to be reset completely to zero. As, as time goes on, the radiation field around the material cause again restoring the energy, allowing it to rise in the, the amount of energy inside. And we do the sampling, we do dating the target event, which is, which is the last time the material was exposed to heat or to light. In the lab, we extract the Phyllis bars antiquas. We measure the amount of energy stored by shining light to the mineral. And we calculate the total energy stored in the calibrated in terms of those and divided it by the rate of storing energy per year, known from the radioactivity background in the barrier environment. And that's how we calculate the OSL edge. However, this scenario is working for the Lucy grains for sediments, but it is different when we are dealing with rock and solid matrices of rocks. In that 
terms or in that uh, concept, luminescent signals do not evade or bleach directly by exposing to sunlight. That is because the sunlight penetrates gradually into the rock matrices. Therefore, the rock surface may date in, it, it depends or depends on the gradual luminescence bleaching signal into the deep into the rock as a function of depth and time. To understand that, imagine that we drilled a core from the rock solid matrices. This rock has never been exposed to light. So if we took this core and tried to cut the cores into slices, each slice of one millimeter thickness. And then this slice, we measured the luminescence intensity into it. If the rock has never been exposed to light, we will find that each slice has the, its maximum level of luminescence signal inside it. However, if the rock has been exposed to light, then the light, sunlight, or uh, what kind of, whatever of light will start to penetrate into the surface of the rock. That will allow for signal to be penetrated, to be bleached into the rock. However, it does not bleach all at once. If you repeat the process, for example, at, after one hour of exposure to light, and you try to measure the luminescence intensity signal into this. After one hour, you will see that the first layer or the first uh, millimeter of the core has partially lost its uh, luminescence signal, but not fully reset or fully bleach the signal. After one day, we might notice that the first millimeter or the first layer has completely lost its signal. Maybe after 100 days, the light penetration can go deep into the first five millimeters and completely resetting the signal into these surface layers. However, deep into the rock, there is still a partial of bleaching the signal. This process can continue as long the uh, rock is exposed to light. The, the longer it is exposed to light, the deeper the signal is fully bleached into the rock. When we have the luminescence profile measured at the lab, we can use uh, model expressions, mathematical equations to express this uh, uh, light exposure and signal bleaching. This is the first equation that we use as a modeling expression. This expression only used if the rock has been exposed to light for one time. However, if the rock has been uh, exposed for several events or sequence events or from exposure to light, burial again, and another exposure to light, that means bleaching the signal, building the signal, and again bleaching the signal. So we will have different profiles in this case. If we use this profile or trying to measure them, this is the first case. This is the first case, I'm sorry. The rock has never exposed to light. The whole core of the rock is completely has in, in its saturation level or has in the full amount of storing energy into it. The rock has been exposed to light for some time, quite enough to bleach the first millimeter of the core and has some or partial luminescent signals deep into about 25 millimeters. This is kind of ideal uh, example, but in nature it might differ in the uh, depth into the rock. If the rock is again has been buried, buried because of using the rock into buildings or using the rock in pavements or for natural causes, then the rock will start to store energy again into its minerals, allowing the signal build up into the rock. So we will have a different profile in the lab. This profile showing that the luminescent signal is higher in this case, but it is still have some history or record from its previous event exposure to light. This bar, the green bar, shows that the, the rock has previously been exposed to light and then covered again into a uh, to build its energy again. If the rock has been exposed for a second time uh, to sunlight, then it will start again to lose its energy. And then we will have a new shape of the profiles. The new shape of the profiles showing the previous events also recorded into this shape of the profile. Here is the last exposure to light. Here is the second, the first burial, and here is the first exposure to light. So each time the rock has an event of barrier or exposure, 
the new profile carry information or records from the previous events. If we measure the luminescence signals into the lab, we can use the mathematical equations to, mod to fit the models and know how many times their profile, uh, the rock, sorry, have been exposed or buried into a, the, a, to build the, sorry, the energy. And by using these equations, we can calculate the time since last burial. We can also calculate how long the rock has been exposed to sunlight. So, uh, so of course you can use those uh, maybe fitting, uh, sorry, fitting equations, but we also can calculate using the best bleach layers to use them as the ones that can tell us the time of barrier. To give any examples and case studies of these rocks. Um, no, first, I, I'm sorry, I will talk about sampling and sampling variation. To collect the rock samples in the field, there's no specific way or specific procedure to collect these rocks. You can either pick up the whole rock from the field, or you can cut part of the rock into the field and take this part that interests you, or this part that you know it can tell you the target the event or target time you are dating. You can also use different kinds of uh, cutting the rocks. If it's easier rock, you can use a hammer or you can use also of the electric plates like in this case. However, some people are worried about exposure to light during sampling. Usually it's not a big of a, a problem that you're afraid that you will lose some of the signal to the surface when you are collecting the samples. However, it is always cautious if you collect the samples and put them directly into black bags to seal them from, from light. The more uh, speed up in this process, you get more secure for your samples that you are not exposed or lost part of the signals during the sampling process. Into the lab, we do drilling for the rock uh, surfaces using a diamond uh, drill. The diamond drill usually have a diameter of one centimeter or as available in your lab. Usually I use 2.5 centimeters because it's easier for uh, to cut them into pieces. Then this, the cores are cut into slices using the uh, a diamond referring saw plate using the low, low speed or the raw speed, I'm sorry to cut them into uh, slices of one millimeter for measurement. To use them for measurements, if we have the uh, one centimeter diameter slice, we can put them directly into the wheel that goes to the OSR reader, or we can use them as a small pieces or uh, chips, uh, breaking each one into small chips and load them also to the reader, or in some cases, a scientist convert these solid rocks into grains to separate Phyllis bars from aquatic grains and be more accurate and precise in their measurements for the signal they are targeting. Now the case studies that I will present you for the rock surface dating. First, I will present two studies for the megalithic structures in Jordan. The first case is about the desert kite. Desert kites are large stone structures that cannot be noticed from the ground level or surface on the, well, we are in the ground surface, I'm sorry, but they can be detected from the aerial photography or satellite images like in this uh, photo. They have variety of forms, but the most common shape for them is the one that takes the children toy kite. Usually they are having long stone walls that could reach to a few hundred of meters and take the funnel shape. They are known as the guiding walls. They end up into an enclosure, also from a stone, dry stone structures. Into the corners of this enclosure, we can see small rooms or traps. This shape of the kite is designed, has been studied or suggested by scholars for gazelle hunting. The gazelle hunting is because the, the, the gazelle or the animals are chased into the uh, funnel shear walls, into the enclosures where the hider, uh, the trace hunters, I'm sorry, will be waiting for them into those, those small chambers for hunting. This part of the rock art that showed or uh, support this hypothesis. They have been seen 
Firstly, in Jordan around 1927 by the British Royal Air Pilots when they were uh, flying between Amman and Baghdad. But now they, there is almost 4,000 of these desert kites are spread all over the Levant area, part of Oman and Yemen, and also in uh, Asia, like Armenia. In Jordan itself, there's around 1,300 of these structures that has been detected and uh, seen so far. Uh, the, this case study that I will present is, has been applied to one of the desert kites that is near the uh, southern border of Jordan and Saudi Arabia, which is called the uh, Jibal Ghadawiyat kite. Despite that this kite has so many uh, or large number of them found in Jordan, but still dating them was also always a problem because uh, there's a lack of the organic materials that is found near these uh, desert kites. And always dating has depended on the uh, association with pottery shards, uh, flint material, and other uh, cultural material that found in the vicinity of these kites. But there's no direct way to dating these structures except for now has been proved to be the rock surface dating. The Jibel Ghadawiyat kite, which take now the uh, like a typical shape of a desert kite, in the trench in 2014, a trench was opened in one of the chambers in this area. And it showed that it, had, it is a bit which is dug into the floor. And this bit has been lined up with rocks like a wall around the, that circulate the bit. Oh, uh, half of the bit was open. The second half, we can see that the bit is filled with sediment. In the right corner of these sediments, there's a fill of rocks. It seems that these rocks that uh, in the fill uh, is actually the standing wall on top of the surface of the floor that has been destro destroyed and filled inside the pit. We collected a three rock samples for this case. We took one rock sample from the lining goals. And this rock sample, obviously, that is a human made that we are targeting the time of building this wall into a bed. We took two samples also lying into the beneath the sediment from the fill, and that is the time of destruction of the, the, of the bed and started to filling it with the sediments. Using the rock sample uh, surface profiles. This is for the first rock. The profile is a clear uh, showing a, a sequence of exposure and burial events. Uh, I should have mentioned that when we collected these rocks, especially these rocks, we collected after six months of opening the bed. That means that this rock has been exposed to light for six months after it's been excavation. And that allows also for a loss of the signal. So we use the letter I to denote for the inward of the surface and use the letter O to denote for the outward, the, the surface that is touching the uh, wall of the pit. So, this is showing exactly that we are here in the middle of the rock, that it is a saturation, that both surfaces has been exposed previously to light, and that is from the drop of the signal in these two parts. And now the all surface that is not shown or not seen from this picture is actually has been exposed to light and then built up the signal. While the eye surface, the inward surface, has been previously buried and then exposed to light, which is the excavation time. To show more, more in detail and easier to understand what is the history of this rock, this is the typical or the original situation of the rock. Both surfaces, the eye surface and the off surface has been covered and the luminescent signal into it was completely into saturation. At some point in the, sometime in the past, the ore surface has been exposed to light. And it seems it was exposed by natural events, but it was exposed for enough time to completely bleach the signals up to 20 millimeters deep into the surface. Then the man came, picked up the rock and used it in building the kite. He put the ore surface 
touching the wall and letting the ice surface exposing to the light. So the ice surface started to build up the signal gradually, while the ice surface started to lose its signal. During this time, the kite was in use. Later, the kite was stopped from being used and has been abandoned and allowed the sediment to fill the, this chamber or this pit. When the both surfaces now are completely covered, the O part or the O outward part kept on storing energy and it raised the amount of energy up to like double from its original. However, the eye surface, it has been building up the uh, energy, but it wasn't building up deeper than three millimeter. When the archaeologists opened the bit six months for six months before sampling, the eye surface has lost part of its signals and it completely bleach the signals at least for the first two millimeters while the old surface was still covered from sunlight so it was still having its original uh, signal or the stored signal this is used by the mathematical equations for modeling and then we calculated the ages the time of burial we know that the uh, old surface has been buried around 9000 years plus minus or seven and the ice surface has been also buried for 9,000 years. You see that both of them are consistent with two sigma of errors. This time of excavation is, we know the first two millimeters has lost because of six months of exposure to light. For the second two rocks, we almost have the same story. They were in saturation. This is the one that is lying in the floor of the bed. This is a saturation level. At one point of the time, they have lost signal because exposure to sunlight, the most surfaces. And that might be during the, the building of the wall that it was ex the two surfaces was exposed from the two sides of the rock. And when it fell into the uh, pit and the sediment was filling in, the two surfaces started to build up the signal. This has obviously the, this surface has not lost a lot of the signal. That's why we see a large age, 13,000, but the top surface is also about 10,000 years ago. The third rock has the same story, except that one surface did not been, have not been exposed to light, while the other surface show a burial age of around 10,000 years. Now, if we see the three edges, the three burial ages for the three rocks. The main rock that we focused on, the one that was used for lining the wall, because we know it's a human activity. The ice surface show an age, show an age of 9.7 thousand years before present. It is almost consistent with one sigma of error with the two other surfaces. To confirm our uh, rock surface ages, ages, especially that this was the first application of the modeling expressions that was developed in uh, 2015, we used an edge control for the sediments uh, in the pit. We know that these sediments has been filling the pit after the kite was construction. So dating the sediments is actually dating the kite constructions after at least it was abandoned by a few years. We used the a conventional OSL methods to collect samples and use them for dating. We took two profiles of OSL sediments using the tubes, profile one and the profile two. And as you see in this graph, we have our rock samples, the first the lining rock, the two ones from the filling. We took also one sediment sample from the rock we dated exactly below the rock. So the time the rock fill in this layer of the sample, we did the time of falling of the uh, rock. The OSL edges for the two uh, uh, sedimentary profiles show that that's, uh, the position happened it, in two stages. The first stage, the average deposition time was around 10,000 years. And the second deposition event happened around 8,000 years. 
The two sediment samples from below the rock is actually within the time of 10,000 years. So if we look at the overall OSL ages, sediment and rocks all at once in the same drop. Under the black lines, we can see a consistent and agreement between sediments and the three rocks. And later, like in 1,000 years, the sediment has spilled more into the, uh, the bed. This study confirms that the rock surface dating process is quite accurate to give the time of the burial of the surfaces for the rocks. The burial events could be caused by building the, the wall, like in this case for surface O, or by covering the place because of destruction or because of natural events or because of human used to bury the rock or to use it for a pavement or others. This case actually is considered one of the few studies that has been used for chronology building for the desert guides. And we hope that this can be used later more for the desert guides, especially that some scholars believe that the desert guides was still being used and built in the last uh, uh, or in the 1800th century. In the second case for the rock surface dating is also a megalithic structures that exist in Jordan. But this case is not a kite megalithic structure. It is a shape or a mega a, a structure that take a linear shape. It's called Khat Shabib and Khat in Arabic means line or as some scholars call it in English, Shabib wall. It is a line structure that extends to about 150 kilometers in south of Jordan. The wall or the line is actually consists of one layer of stone structure that are arranged next to each other and take uh, a width of about one meter to two meters. Such as the desert guides, the, the, the function of this wall is still unknown. Why it was constructed or when it was constructed is still a question that scholars try to answer it. So we wanted to, uh, to answer the question of when it was constructed. Collected, I collected two rocks from this wall. We actually took several rock, uh, rocks, but the best two rocks that give luminescence signal, we used them for dating the, uh, the line. We took them from the surface. As you can see, both of the rocks are covered into the sediments. So we took the two rocks. We measured only the buried part. If I can go back here, sorry. We only measured the part that is buried by sediments. The top surface, we did not bother to measure it because we know it has been exposed to light for so many years. Maybe since it was constructed, maybe it was covered and then cleared up this dust. However, the bottom layer is for sure it was buried when the wall was constructed. Here are the two rocks or uh, example of the cores that we drilled into the two, rock or, uh, into the two rocks. The case here is different from the desert kite because the bleaching was not deep into the rock surface like the rocks from the desert kite. The, the deepest bleaching we noticed only for one core was to five millimeters. The others were barely for the first two or three millimeters. Some cores from the rocks has even barely bleached the first millimeter. So we have to know that this variation in bleaching in the same surface by different cores might be caused because of a vegetation into the rock or because of a dust was covering part of the, uh, of the rock. However, all the cores agree that there is a history of light exposure, which is before building the wall, and then building a wall and bury, which allowed for luminescent signal to grow up. So how we will calculate the ages for these rocks? Because the, there's a, a, a variation, on the amount of bleaching for the surfaces. So we put a criteria that we take the ratio between the signal after burial, which is the signal that we are measuring in the lab, 
to the signal before barrier, which is the signal we don't know, but we predict it using the modeling expressions. If the ratio between them was less than 3%, that means that the, this core has seen enough light to fully bleach the signal and then allowing it to build up after barrier. And then we are sure that the signal that we are using for calculating the age is a signal that happened after the burial, and there's no inherited, uh, uh, inherited signal from before. So what we mean is the geological signal or the geological edge. So for the different cores that we drilled into the two rocks, we took the ratio three uh, between the signal before and after burial, and we took the only the cores that we were less than 3%, and see at what depth they were really bleached. Some of the cores were really bleached at two millimeters and some of the cores were at five millimeters. Some of the cores like in this case has even not really bleached before barriers. So we excluded this from the age calculation. The two crocs after averaging the really bleached layers showed an a burial age of about 2,400 years before now. And that it would, uh, the time of construction, uh, like early Roman under uh, the Persian influence, when Jordan was under the Persian influence. In, in the last case, we use the rock surface to identify the time of constructing and potential of repair and maintenance work for the agricultural terraces that exist in Jordan. The agricultural terraces system in Jordan, especially in Metro region, has always been dated using the, uh, 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 the associations or with pottery shards or, or, or with organic materials. OSL has also been used to date these terraces structures, but they use them to date the sediments the, and deposits behind the wall, because these walls are used to always to harvest water or to control water flow and the uh, uh, floods that was in the uh, Stevie Mountains. So they used to date the sediments that lie in behind these walls. However, this is considered indirect way of dating or having the time of construction of the walls because depositions behind the wall could have been there before the construction or they have been after the construction uh, with a long time. Also the depositions because the, they are stopping the flash floods that happened suddenly, they could be intermixing and the uh, most disturbance of the depositions. So always uh, it has been approved, it is a good way, but it could have been doubted that we are dating the time of construction. However, rock surface could be a good method for dating these structures. So we tried this method in one of the wall uh, terraces that exist in a Hish area located near uh, North to Betra uh, region. We took two rocks, the one rock we took it from the filling of the wall. The wall is about two meters thick. So we picked up the surface layer, which is already exposed to sunlight. And we took it from the uh, filling of this wall. So we are sure that this rock has been covered from sunlight only during the time of construction of the wall. The second rock has been taken from the uh, base or the foundation of this wall. It also was used there as with the, uh, the foundation or the base layer of the wall and then build up the walling top. The, the luminescent signal was not quite good in these two rocks. Despite that it is sandy rock, it is very rich with the quartz, but the sensitivity of these quartz were, were very weak for the luminescent signals. However, we could identify from, as you can see from the first inspection that we have the saturation level, and then we have exposure event, and then we have a burial event with, uh, which allowed for the OSL signal to grow up. This is uh, for the first rock and the second rock. All the cores 
from the same surface is showing that. So we used as the previous criteria to understand the uh, history of the rocks. They were in saturation when they were lying in the area. They were allowing the uh, exposing to light allowed for the signal to drop down in both rocks. Using the rocks in, construct in constructing the wall allowed for the signal to grow up. So this looks ideal. However, we use the same uh, method we used in the Khatshabi. We excluded the, uh, the cores that were not really bleached because the ratio between the signal before bleaching and before burial and after a burial was less than 3%. So we calculated the age for the layers that are considered really bleached for each core by itself. The first core, for example, in rock one, did not give an uh, appropriate age because the ratio was above the 3%, but the other three cores were given a, a good calculation for the OSL ages. However, if you notice, in some of these cores, they were young. The average is 1.7 plus minus uh, 300 years. 1.7 kilo year or 1,700 kilo years plus minus 300 years. And another course give an average age of 3,000 years. And that's big difference between the two averages. We could conclude from that, that those two rocks were used in construction sometime before 3,000 years ago. And they were in repair or reworking for the wall later about 1,700 years ago. So we cannot say that the wall of the, or, the, or this terrace has been built 3,000 years, but maybe there was a beginning or a starting of having this wall 3,000 years ago. But the real construction time could, lay a, could be around 1,700 years ago. And that's like also in the Nabatian times, and that agrees with the pottery shards that were heavily distributed around this wall. As a conclusion, you can see that the rock surface dating has a wide application now in both archaeological studies, such as the constructions of buildings, pavements, field walls, cairns, and megalithic structures. They also have been used in geomorphology studies, such as the uh, cobble beaches or fault scrubs or a uh, glacier's uh, movement for the rocks. It's, it showed that it has a potential of dating beyond even the OSL dating because the rock surface losing its signal is slower than when it is uh, like a losing grains. And thank you very much for your attention. Can I stop the recording now? Yes. Uh, if you can do that, because I. Okay, uh, shall try from here.